Okay, ladies, the screencast is going to start with kind of our conclusion of the War of 1812 with the Battle of New Orleans. Um, and so just know that, as a reminder, before the news that the Treaty of Ghent had been signed could make it all across the United States, Andrew Jackson had already launched a war, or I'm sorry, a battle um, in the city of New Orleans. Um, consider why England would want to fight a battle here just because of it being a port city and its value and resource um, being the point of access to the Mississippi River. Um, and so it was an unintentional battle, uh, unnecessary I should say, since the war had technically already been won, but these Americans in the South don't know that yet. So Andrew Jackson will lead the American military into battle, and he will, uh, he will succeed in achieving an impressive victory. Um, Jackson is able to defeat the British completely. This um, boosts American pride, and Jackson's kind of seen as a war hero. Um, do kind of consider that it's a bit ironic, <laughs> because it's not really necessary that the war, the battle was even fought. Um, but it's still an important victory, because you could go into the theory of, well, what would have happened if the British would have won this battle, even though the treaty had been signed, maybe they would have been um, less likely to relinquish uh, New Orleans back to the Americans at the end of the war. So we are still happy that um, Jackson was able to secure a victory. So what are the overall results of the war? Um, the war confirmed the American control of the Mississippi River. The War of 1812 did secure and reconfirm American independence from Great Britain. It did promote patriotism as Americans are very proud of their um, success and not losing any more territory to England. And it also results in the failure of the Federalist Party. Um, recall that the Federalists were not supportive of the War of 1812 because we kind of emerge as the somewhat victors since England threw in the towel first um, and was willing to negotiate the treaty with us. Now being a Federalist just seems unpopular and unpatriotic, so they're going to kind of demise in influence and power over time and cease to exist as a party. Um, also, some sad news. Uh, so, sorry to drop this uh, news now, but the face of the Federal, uh, Federalist Party is no longer with us. That is, of course, one Mr. Um, Alexander Hamilton. As he just pushed Aaron Burr's buttons a few too many times, Aaron Burr will... Uh, during Jefferson's presidency, actually challenged Hamilton to a good old-fashioned duel, um, which is an old gentleman's shootout, and Aaron Burr will effectively shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton. Um, so that's, that's how Hamilton goes out. Very um, dramatic ending to that tale and that um, controversy um, and enemy status. But uh, with him gone, and that's the leader of the Federalist Party, um, because they're also just unpopular after the war, they're going to cease to exist. One other quick note about the um, presidency of James Madison, as you see him on the screen. Um, recall that the first national bank that had been proposed by Hamilton was approved initially for a 20-year charter. That charter had expired um, earlier on in Ma Madison's presidency, and he allowed it to expire. Um, so it was not initially renewed. But because of the war, we saw the um, national economy not doing well. Currency in America experienced high inflation, and overall the economy was just very unstable. So the government kind of saw the need to reinstitute the bank. Um, and so a second charter would be approved for the second national bank. Um, it's again approved for 20 years so another 20-year charter put on the National Bank under Madison's direction. Madison will be replaced by the fifth president, James Monroe, who is a Democratic Republican, um, since that's the main party at this time, since the Federalists have kind of lost popularity overall. Um, his two terms in office are known as the era of good feelings. Um, the Federalists had fallen apart, so there's overall more... Uh, political unity, though however brief it may be in the country. Relations with England were the best they had been in a really long time um, because we are finally at a good, peaceful resolve with them where they're not attacking our ships and um, trying to challenge our status of independence. 
There's also just a strong sense of like national pride and nationalism in the United States um, during Monroe's presidency. So it's kind of just this period of good feelings and happiness in America. Things are the most peaceful they've been in, in over 100 years. So that's why he gets to be the lucky president over um, or in charge of the executive branch during this time. So president during the era of good feelings. I want to talk about one big conflict um, that occurs during uh, Monroe's presidency, and that's over the territory of Florida. So since acquiring Florida, I'm sorry, since acquiring Louisiana, the Louisiana Territory, um, in 1803, U.S. officials had tried various measures to get Spain's territory in Florida. Um, recall that... Uh, we now own like all of the land, you know, east Mississippi River, including the Mississippi itself, pretty much except for Florida. Um, in 1818, there's a conflict with the Seminole Indians um, that gives America a new opportunity to try to um, acquire Florida. The Seminoles had encouraged runaway slaves from the United States to seek refuge in their territory in Florida, um, just to kind of weaken the American control of that region. Well, that makes Americans angry, obviously. So Jackson will take the lead um, as military general in trying to gain control of Florida by attacking the Seminoles in what's called the First Seminole War. Um, he will in, now keep in mind that while the Seminoles are very present in Florida, the Spanish government was technically controlling part of this region. So he will invade um, Spanish territory in Florida with a force of volunteer soldiers, um, army soldiers, as well as Native American allies, the few that we have. Um, he did send word uh to President Monroe that basically said, I want to seize, you know, the rest of Eastern Florida. And he didn't receive an immediate reply from President Monroe. So we kind of took that as a license to act freely, which is a bit um, gregarious of him. Uh, he is going to successfully capture a Spanish fort. He will attack multiple Seminole villages. He will burn property. Um, he eventually occupies the Spanish-controlled capital of Pensacola, and he expelled the Spanish governor and claimed that Spain would have basically have to give up Florida since they weren't able to control their Seminole people within the region and within Spanish territory. Um, by the time all this news makes it to Washington of what Jackson's doing and how aggressive he's being in Florida, uh, it's causing quite an uproar in D.C. Um, most of Monroe's cabinet believes that Jackson has exceeded his powers and his orders and has gone a little bit too far. Um, but Monroe's Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, who is John Adams' son, will be able to ease tension with um, treaty negotiations with Spain. So I'm now going to transition to the last section of our notes today, which focuses on Monroe's um, Secretary of State, JQA, um, formerly known as John Quincy Adams. So Adams, like I said, was Monroe's Secretary of State, which means he deals with foreign affairs. He will earn himself the nickname or title of Great Negotiator because of his multiple successes with foreign negotiations. And so I'm going to give you several treaty examples that he's responsible for dealing with and just foreign diplomacy and you see these examples listed on the screen if you're concerned about spelling any of them. So with the Rush Bagot Treaty, this is a treaty signed between JQA and not just JQA but negotiated between him and Great Britain um, where both the American government and the British government agreed to reduce their military vessels they had in the Great Lakes kind of demilitarizing the Great Lake region. That is the water region between like northern United States and southern Canada. You know, we're not at war with England anymore, so why have the tense military relationship? He will also negotiate with England over the northern border of the Louisiana Purchase to officially be named at the 49th parallel. And additionally with Great Britain, um, 
Great Britain agreed to recognize some U.S. territorial rights in the Oregon Territory. The Oregon Territory was the most northwestern portion of the kind of extending beyond the Louisiana Purchase, and we had claimed some of that land in Great Britain, and even Spain had claimed some of that land, um, but Great Britain is recognizing that we do indeed possess some of it. What exact parallel it is divided at is not established yet, but they do acknowledge that we are um, partial owners at this time. The next big treaty is the treaty I mentioned earlier because this adams Onish treaty is going to be what kind of gets us out of hot water with Spain um, as Adams is able to come with an agreement um, with Spain kind of following um, the Seminole War uh, in Florida. So in the adams Onis treaty, he negotiated with Spain um, the purchase of Florida for $5 million dollars. So we purchased the remaining Spanish uh, Floridian territory for $5 million. And we also established the western border of the Louisiana Purchase um, because, you know, it was kind of argued like how far west into Spanish-controlled like southwestern America, I think like present-day New Mexico and California, um, Louisiana, like went into. And so we decide in the adams Onis Treaty how far west that territory does include. Um, and then finally, the um, adams Onis Treaty also uh, stipulated that Spain recognized U.S. rights in Oregon as well. Um, but we, in turn, agreed to ignore all claims to Texas. Um, the Texas territory was a Spanish-controlled territory, and they said basically like you can have rights in Oregon but you have no rights in Texas and we agree to that per the adams Onis Treaty as well. The last aspect of John Quincy Adams negotiations is really not a negotiation at all but a public service announcement really and it's known as the Monroe Doctrine named after of course President Monroe um, published in, in Monroe's name but written itself by his Secretary of State JQA. So the Monroe Doctrine announced that European nations were no longer allowed to colonize or interfere in the Western Hemisphere, the New World. Like kind of America is coming out and saying, we're good, this land is spoken for, y'all all need to kind of mind your own business, stay out of Western Hemisphere's affairs, and don't try to intervene. Um, the, U the U.S. does warn in the Monroe Doctrine that if... Europe tried to intervene, um, the U.S. would stop them. But in turn, it said that the U.S. would remain neutral in European affairs. So it basically said, we're not going to try to mess in the Eastern Hemisphere or affairs going on abroad. So that's why you need to respect our space and independence on this side of the globe. So this is kind of an example of an isolationist policy. Isolation, like on your own, in your bubble. You know, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. But he's also kind of indirectly declaring that the U.S. is the leader of this hemisphere because that we're the ones who have the authority or the power to make this sort of assertion um, to the rest of the European countries who would maybe be tempted to challenge our um, authority and presence in the new world that isn't becoming so new anymore. All right, so that was a good bit of information, but I wanted to make sure we covered the expansion into new territories such as Florida and Oregon. Um, if you have any additional questions, please let me know and I will um, go over this, the rest of this in class tomorrow. I hope you have a good day.